In this episode, we're going to look at fraud that targets the elderly. A fiduciary is a person that's entrusted with handling someone's financial affairs. In one case, we'll show you how a trusted fiduciary, recommended by lawyers and other authority figures, spent her client's life savings on her own gambling habit. Our second story shows how one elderly man fell in love with a young woman who had her sights set squarely on his bank account. But first, we're going to tell the story about how one woman found out far too late that the fraudster in this case was actually her own daughter. In uh, June of 2007, uh, I became aware that uh, my mother was not being looked after properly. She had been financially abused. Somebody had taken all of her money and uh, left her basically destitute. Majority of abuse against seniors is financial. About 80%, in fact. At the end of the day, somebody wants their money, unfortunately. I knew that she should have approximately 150 some odd thousand. The money kind of just disappeared. Uh, it didn't show up on my mother's banking records and it was like somebody had stuck a needle in the back of your head. That was my first reaction, like, what do you mean? You just have to sign here and here and then you don't even have to worry about a thing. My mother apparently made my sister power attorney uh, without any knowledge of my father or myself. As power of attorney, Thank you. My sister virtually, from, from a financial standpoint, became my mother. A power of attorney is a legal document where you give someone the right to access your finances for your benefit. Most seniors, when they make their power of attorney documents, they make their, their family, usually their son or daughter. And for the most part, that's fine. But there are sons and daughters out there who are stealing from their parents. At that time, my mother, she was about $18,000 in debt to her caregivers, uh, which was a you know, municipality that she lived in. In this case, the uh, senior had dementia. And as the power of attorney, this daughter proceeded to steal $163,000 from her mother's bank account. It was my sister that had that it uh, basically neglected my mother to start with. This daughter uh, chose to go into the bank account and withdraw all this money, and she used a large portion of this money at the casino. So she took them out of the bank machines at the, at the casino, and we're kind of assuming that that's where most of the money went. I received information from the casino that between her winnings and losings, and her winnings and losings, she gambled in excess of $1 million. What do you need? Went to the police. Uh, my first encounter with the police was not really good. I was told maybe I should look after it civilly. And after a large conversation about why I shouldn't have to look after it civilly, we did a report. Shortly after that, uh, I become involved, became involved with uh, Sergeant John Keating. I was shocked by it, uh, horrified by it, that somebody could actually take almost every penny that their mother had and use it for their own purpose. John's very passionate about elder abuse, and eventually we got enough information that we arrested my sister, or as I call her now, my mother's daughter. The daughter was arrested and brought to police to be interrogated. But when she found out she was going to be charged, she made an outlandish request. My mother had a silver fox fur coat and hat that my dad had bought to her bought for her uh, on one of his trips back home to Poland. And uh, John arrested her, they went through all that process, and then she turned to John and she said, do you think it'd be okay if I kept my mother's silver fox hat and coat? We've never seen it to this day. So this matter went to court, and uh, this particular daughter was convicted of stealing this money from her mother. Uh, from her standpoint, you know, uh, a slap on the wrist was basically what they were thinking was going to happen. At this rate, it looks like she could get away with it. Okay. The I judge went out to uh, deliberate how he was going to sentence her. And my wife actually pointed out that she had lied when the judge asked how much money she made in a year. Why are senior citizens often targeted by fraudsters? 
Is it that seniors will have a nest egg of cash that fraudsters want to steal? Seniors are sometimes more trusting and polite and find it difficult to say no or just hang up the phone. Seniors are less likely to report being the victim of a scam or all of the above. The answer is all of the above. Fraudsters like to target seniors because they know there's a lifetime of savings they can get their hands on. Help protect the seniors that you know. The judge went out, John Keating came up, started to walk back, so I said to him, that's not right. Like, she has more money than that. She's, you know, gets more money than that. And he asked me if I could get a hold of my brother-in-law, who I still get along with. And I said, yes, we phoned him in Nova Scotia. Uh, he spoke to John, and when the judge came back in, the uh, prosecutor at the time said, before you, uh, you know, past sentence here, there's something else you should know. You could see in his face that he was just furious. And there's not a lot of uh, elder abuse cases in court, uh, at least there wasn't uh, a year or so ago when this took place. But we found that the judge was, uh, was excellent. He gave a great sentence. Um, I believe she was sentenced to a couple years of house arrest um, and ordered to pay uh, restitution and several years probation as well. Elder abuse, financial abuse of this type, is starting to gain momentum across the country and, and uh, we have different police services that are actually starting to do something about it. Seniors are from a generation where when things happened within their family, bad things, they kept it between the four walls. Mom is never going to tell anybody because she doesn't want to uh, spread the bad things around that are going on in her family. She's embarrassed of the fact that one of her children might be harming her, stealing her money. So they keep it between the four walls quite often. In my mother's case, they beat her. You don't see the blood and the, and the wounds, but they are there. The fiduciary is a person entrusted with handling someone's financial affairs. One case will show you how a trusted fiduciary, recommended by lawyers and other authority figures, spent her client's life savings on her own gambling. Teresa Lagner was a, a private fiduciary in the San Diego area. Ms. Lagner had built up a reputation over a variety of years as, as being someone who was trustworthy and could be appointed or hired as a fiduciary. When a trust became open where a fiduciary was necessary to be appointed, Mrs. Lagner's uh, name came up quite often. A fiduciary is generally someone who is entrusted with handling the financial affairs of someone else and the way you handle those have to be completely for the benefit of the beneficiary of the trust. The Secret Service investigate various types of financial crimes, uh, different types of bank frauds, credit card frauds, anything basically to do with the financial institutions. The Lagner case came to my attention uh, during a monthly meeting that we have as part of our task force. Uh, after we subpoenaed the bank accounts for Ms. Lagner, uh, and had access to the bank accounts uh, that belonged to the trusts and the estates, uh, we were able to determine that large amounts of uh, money, large chunks of the money, was being uh, transferred. In this case, what she was able to do quite easily is make financial uh, transfers of monies from the bank accounts of the beneficiaries to her own personal and business accounts. In fact, she was able to do this all on the internet, online banking. The Secret Service received information of a uh, suspicious activity report that one of the banks had reported that uh, caused, caused them to believe that something was strange going on in a particular trust account. She made all of the transfers electronically, and then she was able to withdraw those either through ATMs or writing checks at the casinos, and they would cash them for her. Very often, a lot, the beneficiaries were uh, elderly. They were uh, mentally infirm. What she did was target large trusts where the beneficiary was not fully aware of all the financial transactions. We knew that Ms. Lagner had been uh, transferring funds from victim accounts, so it was an ongoing criminal enterprise. Uh, and because of that, uh, we knew that it was uh, essential for us to work the case as quickly as possible. After we determined that money was being spent at local casinos, uh, agents conducted a surveillance of Ms. Lagner both at her business uh, and at the casino. As far as winnings go, uh, she seemed to be losing a lot more money than she was winning. There was quite a bit of money that went through the casinos, uh, as, almost as much as a million dollars. The primary amount of money was going towards her gambling habit. 
There was one trust in particular that was left for a elderly woman who was a cancer survivor. She was uh, particularly devastated because Ms. Lagner was actually the second fiduciary who came on her case. Uh, the first fiduciary was also stealing from this particular victim. She personally interviewed and hired Ms. Lagner and then later learned that she had been lied to and Ms. Lagner was stealing money from her. We, had, we found that there was over $100,000 that was taken from this particular victim and gambled away at the casinos. Once we were able to place her at the casino on several occasions, uh, we felt comfortable enough to then bring the case and present it to the United States Attorney's Office. She was ultimately charged with wire fraud, meaning that she was causing losses to people using the interstate transmissions, and in this case, both internet uh, banking transactions and uh, wire transfers. Once the search warrants were obtained, uh, we served simultaneous warrants on both her house and her uh, business at the same time. During the execution of the search warrant at her residence, immediately upon entering her house, uh, we encountered a house in complete disarray. Uh, it seemed uh, to everybody involved that we had an individual who uh, was into hoarding things. Uh, there were boxes everywhere. Uh, there were uh, animal feces on the floor, um, and there were uh, food products that seemed to have been purchased from the store uh, weeks and months prior that uh, sat uh, stale on the counter. After securing the location, we located uh, Ms. Lagner and her husband inside of the home. Uh, agents searched the home and uh, I conducted an interview with Ms. Lagner. During the search of the residence, we seized a number of uh, boxes of paperwork that related to uh, various trusts uh, that she had uh, been managing. Ms. Lagner's demeanor was uh, shocked, um, in a way standoffish with the agents who were interviewing her at first. Um, after several minutes into the interview, I got the feeling that Ms. Lagner knew uh, that we had discovered uh, what she had been up to. And uh, she went into a mode of um, simply stating that she had made a mistake. This was the local school foundation. She came in to see both the prosecutor and the agents to go over how many trusts she actually had a control over and how many transactions, illegal transactions, she had actually made. There were quite a few interviews explaining to her the extent of the damage that she caused. She knew that she was taking improperly for a lot, from a lot of the trusts and gambling them away, but she had no idea the extent of the money that she had taken. After we received the material both from her residence and her work, uh, at her work uh, approximately 120 boxes uh, were seized. We were able to determine after uh, combing through the records we seized at her work uh, that they simply did not match with the bank records that we had reviewed uh, from both her bank and the bank records of the victims. When Ms. Lagner met with agents, it was obvious that she was very emotional about what had happened. She had prided herself in being a trust fiduciary for many years and now realized that she had not only let herself down and all of the victims down, but many of the attorneys who had relied on her to be a trustee. She knew that this was the end of her career and was afraid that she would not be able to make amends to all the victims that she took money from. What we learned from this case was that it was quite easy for someone with complete control over trust funds to take and withdraw money immediately. Ms. Lagner was sentenced to 18 months custody in federal prison, and she was also ordered to pay full restitution back for the trust that she had taken from. So ultimately, she was ordered to pay back $471,000. What is a fiduciary? A person to whom property is entrusted for the benefit of someone else? A person who receives the money from a person's bank account? A company that makes loans to trusted persons? Or a company that manufactures fiddles? Well, here's the answer. A fiduciary is a person to whom property is entrusted for the benefit of someone else. They're often given the power to control the financial affairs of someone who cannot take care of their own finances. The women that get involved in these situations are professionals. They know what they're doing. One elderly man fell in love with a young woman who set her sights squarely on his bank account. The sweetheart scams are very successful because for one thing, it's very hard to prosecute. 
Usually the older gentlemen, the gentlemen that these people target, they're either living by themselves, they're recent widows, they're, they've never been married. They usually have a pretty lonely existence. They probably haven't had a female in their life for a while. And when some young, pretty thing flirts with them, the ego gets stroked. One situation that happened right here in Cook County was with an elderly man um, who was alone at a restaurant and had been approached by a woman. The young woman sat down, they started up a conversation. Before you know it, she invited him to dinner. He enjoyed her companionship. They did become friends. Uh, she did have many of the situations, the emergencies coming up in her life. He comes over to dinner. She starts saying that my daughter needs a heart transplant. I need, we need cash now or, or the bills will be astronomical. I do not have insurance. I do not have any other means to pay that. He gave her a check for $60,000. The women who participate in this sweetheart scam are Eastern European and they travel. They're not just located in one location. Now again, this was a man all throughout his life. He was watching every penny he ever made. He did not, he was not go on these exotic vacations. He did not really even go on vacations. Everything he did, he knew down to the penny. He was very cheap in what he did. And also this woman comes into his life again, telling him that, oh, I love you. I, I'm, you know, I care for you. And the next thing you know, probably within a year, year and a half, he is at $400,000. If she wasn't available to visit him at home and, and give him a hug, she would have a family member come a niece, uh, maybe a sister, who knows what the relations were. And never anything that you might imagine, more of just a, a hug, a friendly gesture, something that he didn't have anywhere else, but he was getting from them. She invited him to his house when they got to the house. She was there, a person that she introduced as her brother was there, her brother's kids were there. These all turned out later on to be basically her husband and her children. They sat down, they would have dinner. Next thing you know, they would tell him what a great guy he was. They would show him around the house. They went down to the basement and said, oh, we have to get this basement finished, but we have no money. Uh, I don't know how he willingly admitted, say, I will give you the money to finish the basement. Sure. <laughs> Some of these women that we have been dealing with usually are involved with other scams as well that we have. Um, they are usually from like a clannish group who operate in an extended family type setting where the, usually other members are also involved with some other type of fraud and some other type of theft going on as well. What is this, Dad? Like, look at all the money you have spent on her. He was paying bills for them. He was draining his account. And when his son uh, did see these accounts going down, was outraged, went to the police, made the report. And as the police got involved, the victim would scream at them. He wanted them out of his house. I would go in there and I was asking him how he was doing. I would bring up the subject of this young lady and all of a sudden he would get very defensive. He would say, this is my girlfriend, this is someone that I care about, this is someone that I, I want in my life. As the police would leave his home, he would call and give reports to his sweetheart and let her know that the police were asking and that you know he wanted to reassure her, everything is fine, I love you, and, I, and she would of course say, well, I love you too. He truly believed that this woman cared for him. He truly believed that this woman had his best interests at heart. It's very embarrassing for the, the, the man to come forward and say, I was duped, I was taken advantage of. But then once you've opened his eyes about what has occurred here, it becomes abundantly clear you don't have enough for a criminal act because he voluntarily gave all this money. What is one of the best ways to help protect the seniors in your life from fraudsters? Read all of their mail without their knowledge. Make sure you check out any new friends they make. Be involved in their life. Call regularly and include them in activities. Or study their monthly phone bill for any unusual calls. Well, the correct answer is the best way to determine if a senior in your life may be involved in a fraudulent scheme is to meet with them regularly. Call them and include them in activities. This interaction may help identify if a fraudster has entered their life. At one time, 
he had to go into the hospital. When he was released from the hospital, they did not see he was fit to go home, so he went into this nursing home. The only time she did come around, and this happened probably two to three days before his death. She's in a room with him, um, videoing, making sure uh, to have on tape how much they loved each other, that he never had a problem with their relationship, with the money that he provided. She was videotaping this man, and what she was asking him is, do you want me to be prosecuted? Do you want me to go to jail? Do you want the police to leave me alone? You gave me the money freely, right? Of course. So just in case something came down the road, some charges, she had that on tape. He loved her. He wanted to give her this money. When the victim is depleted, then they will go on to someone else. He could not afford anything. He was basically being on a taxpayer's role. These type of crimes occur all so often, and it's unfortunate that I see no end in sight. 